The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, I don't know what to do. Two swimmers. It just kept getting further and further to the right. Two miles from the shore. All we see is ocean. And no one knows they're out there. I really thought that was going to be the last day of my life. A survival on the high seas. We're not getting out of here alive. Our seven days ablaze continues. This, to me, was our last chance. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. A crackdown on vaping. The White House taking action to ban flavored e-cigarettes. What's driving the surging epidemic? And why is it killing people? Jenna Browder has more. The Trump administration is finalizing plans to ban e-cigarettes that are candy and fruit flavored, responding to a recent surge in underage vaping. Vaping has become a very big business. With the first lady by his side, the president made the announcement Wednesday in the Oval Office. We can't allow people to get sick and we can't have our youth be so affected. And I'm hearing it, and that's how the First Lady got involved. The move comes as the CDC investigates hundreds of lung-related illnesses thought to be caused by e-cigarettes. And data shows more than one in four high school students use e-cigarettes, the majority choosing fruit menthol or mint flavors. At least six people have now died. Data just shows the kids are getting access to these products in spite of our best efforts, we simply have to remove these attractive flavored products from the marketplace. Parents, teachers, and health advocates have increasingly called for a crackdown on e-cigarettes, arguing they're overwhelmingly to blame for the explosion in underage vaping by teens. Federal health officials have called the vaping trend an epidemic, and they worry teens who vape will eventually start smoking. E-cigarette company Juul says it will comply with any new policy. It argues that its products are meant to wean adult smokers off of regular cigarettes. But this proposed ban casts major uncertainty on that claim. And right now there's virtually no research on the long-term effects of vaping, so no one knows what the impact could be on a user's health. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. In other news, President Trump is tweeting about a major triumph. His big win, Ephraim Grimm has that. Pat, the high court is allowing a new Trump administration asylum policy to go into effect. The rule bans asylum for people trying to enter the U.S. after traveling through another country like Mexico without seeking asylum there first. President Trump tweeted the ruling was a big win. Only Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg dissented from the ruling. The court action allows the Republican administration to impose the new policy everywhere while the court's case goes against it. Federal judges are more and more frequently issuing nationwide injunctions that stop residents or Congress in their tracks and basically decides the importance of issues for the entire country. Paul Strand reports why some see the injunctions as a threat to democracy. Of the three branches of government, the judiciary is the only unelected one, and at times, the most powerful. The Obama administration faced 20 nationwide injunctions over eight years. President Trump has already been hit with nearly 40. These judges often halt Congress as well, blocking enforcement of federal laws and policies. Attorney General William Barr wants to stop these injunctions. Writing in the Wall Street Journal, shrewd lawyers have learned to shop for a sympathetic judge willing to issue such an injunction. These days, virtually every significant congressional or presidential initiative is enjoined, often within hours, threatening our democratic system and undermining the rule of law. GOP Congressman Steve Scalise told CBN News it provides a judge near total power. Being a judge does not mean you're a dictator uh, or a czar. Uh, you know, again, you're supposed to be there interpreting the laws that are written and upholding the Constitution. And too often we see a judge that has their own agenda and they try to carry out whatever they want to do as opposed to following what the law says. And that becomes a real danger if not properly checked because who will check the checkers? Jeremy Dice fights for religious freedom through the First Liberty Institute. If the judges themselves are the ones that are going to decide what the Constitution says and we limit that to just one individual, that deprives 330 million Americans of the process that we're familiar with under our Constitution. Used to be Congress would pass a law, the president would sign it, and then it would take effect. 
Now, if a judge steps in with a nationwide injunction to stop it, the president or lawmakers must slog their way through the entire judiciary. The, the average case, I think, to the Supreme Court takes roughly six years to percolate up through the system. As Attorney General Barr states, nationwide injunctions threaten to turn every case into an emergency for the executive and judicial branches. The way the judiciary is supposed to work is local judges decide cases for the people in front of them. Disputed local rulings go before district or circuit courts like the one behind me. And where circuits disagree with each other, the U.S. Supreme Court weighs in for the whole nation which would give a lot more eyes on the situation rather than just one individual sitting in his chambers making the decision. As Barr puts it, a Supreme Court justice must convince at least four colleagues to bind the federal government nationwide, whereas a district court judge issuing a nationwide injunction needn't convince anyone. It always angers me when I see these activist judges, uh, judges who were not elected, uh, who decide instead of interpreting the law, they want to make their own law. And, uh, you, you know, you shouldn't go to the judiciary because you want to be a lawmaker. You should run for Congress. And two men who did just that are taking action. Republican Senator Tom Cotton and Congressman Mark Meadows have introduced the Nationwide Injunction Abuse Prevention Act. If passed, it would prevent lawful policy changes from being blocked by individual district court judges. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Pat, I know you've been concerned about this for quite a few years. I'm very exercised about it because you've got one judge <clears throat> acting as if he can control the entire nation. As far as I'm concerned, a district court judge has jurisdiction within that area and no other. He does not have jurisdiction over the entire nation. And these guys are trying to put nationwide injunctions in place to limit the president of the United States, the Congress, and so forth. It should not be done. Clarence Thomas has mentioned it shouldn't be done. The Supreme Court has, should have stopped it a long time ago. But Congress can, uh, you know, there's a Supreme Court and whatever inferior courts the Congress from time to time appoints. That's what the, the Constitution says. And so in terms of the power and the appellate uh, jurisdiction of these courts, but even the Tenth Circuit, which is, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, Ninth, Ninth Circuit, which has been so liberal, has now begun to turn and limit uh, what some of these uh, district court judges can do. But it's time to stop. Congress should stop. The Supreme Court could have stopped this a long time ago. Clarence Thomas is absolutely right. They should not have jurisdiction beyond the district that they are involved in. And that case that comes before them and only those litigants at that particular thing, but not the entire nation. Uh, it's a disgrace. And it's been used over and over again to try to stop uh, Donald Trump from doing what he wants to do. So what's happened is the Supreme Court has now said in this particular ruling, we, we disagree with that district court. But again, that ruling only applies to the states in which the judge uh, is uh, uh, seated. And the rest of the country is not involved. Even the Supreme Court has allowed the district judge to make a ruling. And that has not been overruled, and nor has that particular issue been litigated. Well, Ephraim, there's going to be a debate. You want to tell us about it? Indeed, there is the top 10 Democratic presidential candidates debate tonight in Houston. Joe, Bi Joe Biden remains the front runner, but it is the first time he'll be on the same stage with Elizabeth Warren, who's emerged as his top challenger alongside Bernie Sanders, raising the question of how the top candidates will deal with each other and concerns about whether the party is moving too far to the left. The debate airs at 8 p.m. Eastern on ABC and could give the candidates their biggest audience yet. A tentative legal settlement has been reached over the role Purdue Pharma played in the nation's opioid addiction crisis. But it falls far short of the far-reaching national settlement the company has been trying to get for months. So legal action is sure to continue against the business and the Sackler family who owns it. The agreement would have Purdue file for a structured bankruptcy and pay as much as $12 billion over time, with about $3 billion coming from the Sackler family. The family would also have to give up its ownership of the company. Pat? Uh, I, I think that it's not enough. It's costing the United States in the neighborhood of, what, 75 or so billion dollars. Uh, this opioid crisis has hit state after state after state. And it's not just Purdue. The Sackler family are the ones that pushed Oxy OxyContin. And they'll still be making OxyContin. 
That's what's so terrible about it. They won't be stopping. They'll still be passing this stuff out. But there are several big companies that have been involved in this, and there should be a huge settlement. This is just a warm-up, but I, I think what they have done is nothing short of criminal and to allow them to continue ownership of the company, just to have billions of dollars of uh, a profit from selling OxyContin and OxyCodone. Uh, and the, the, the opioid crisis is real. And the, uh, well, it's just beyond belief. And we turn to the Bahamas. It's a horrible crisis. It's much worse than anybody dared to dream. It's now an estimated 2,500 people that may be dead. They're listed as missing. Ephraim has more about that. Pat, as you said, an estimated 2,500 people are listed as missing in the Bahamas in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, but the government cautions the names have not yet been checked against the rosters of people who were evacuated or staying in shelters. With that, a government spokesperson expects the number of missing to shrink, but the death toll is still expected to rise significantly. It now stands at 50, but will climb as search and rescue crews make their way through the ruins. The prime minister announced the country will hold a national day of prayer. And more wild weather here in the United States. Three EF2 tornadoes ripped through the center of the nation Wednesday. At least 11 tornadoes were reported in a 24-hour period in the upper Midwest. Now, those three major EF2s were all in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, striking a hospital with winds up to 130 miles an hour. Hospital administrators say their staff worked courageously to get all 102 patients to safety with only about a 10-minute warning. They managed to get them all to the center of the building, and no one was hurt. A beautiful day in the neighborhood. The feature film about the life of Fred Rogers is scoring rave reviews at this week's Toronto Film Festival. It stars Tom Hanks, and it doesn't hit American theaters until November, but we've got an exclusive first look to share of the film right now. It's a decision we make to release a person from the feelings of anger we have at them. Fred Rogers grew up outside of Pittsburgh and he dreamed of being a minister. He went to seminary school and he gave people liberty to explore something deep and vulnerable about themselves. I asked him to pray for me. I figure anyone who is going through what he is going through must be awfully close to God. He had that amazing gift of looking at a person and seeing what that person needed that he was going to minister to that person. And that person in this particular case was me. We are trying to give the world positive ways to deal with their feelings. This piece will be for an issue about heroes. Do you consider yourself a hero? This movie is sort of like an episode of Mr. Rogers for adults. When I think of Fred, I often think of him in terms of what he did every morning, which was pray and think of the people he needed to pray for and write to those people. Cecilia Sherman, Colby Dickerson, thank you, God. His spoken message is simple, but the message of his life is not simple because the message of his life is goodness in action, goodness enacted. I think the best thing we can do is to let people know that each one of them is precious. The film is in theaters in America November 22nd and already is getting nearly perfect reviews. Pat? Tom Hanks is an incredible actor. He is an unbelievable actor, and uh, he's done a perfect job with showing Mr. Rogers. So our hats off to a, a great movie and a great uh, thespian. And a great message for people today. Really is. Amen. Absolutely. All right, what do you got? Well, coming up, a bomb cyclone smashing levees and wiping out billions of dollars worth of farmland. Can these farmers rebuild? And then, swept out to sea, two teens struggling to stay afloat. What saved their lives? Our seven days ablaze continues, and all of that's later on today's show. A 
a bomb cyclone, epic floods, and billions in damages. Midwest farmers are flooded out and left with rotten crops of corn. Abigail Robertson brings us the story of one such farmer who's down but not out and shows us what his loss might mean to your wallet. Just a few months after two epic floods flowed through parts of Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri, here at David Luce Family Farm, you can still smell the rotting corn and see the costly effects of historically high water levels that destroyed any chance for crops in 2019. The hardest thing for me is I have never gone without planting a crop, even on the 150 years of the history of this farm. So this is all new. Problems started in March when a powerful bomb cyclone struck the Midwest. There goes the Mormon Canal Bridge right there. Leading increases in snowmelt and rain to overpower levee systems along the Missouri River. We had such a short time. The roads were thawing out. We couldn't get things, a lot of equipment down the roads because of the ruts, the mud getting stuck. So it was a real mess. All we could do was pretty much grab personal items and get out. The powerful storm and subsequent floods led to some of the worst destruction ever seen here, with damage estimates in the billions. When I saw this picture, I knew we were okay because the porch is, is okay and the floor is on the level of the porch. Mm. Another great act of God to say, let's David says, this. by the grace of God, their house was spared, but the rest of the farm did not fare as well. But it'll easily be in the tens of thousands of dollars. His silo saw the most damage as strong currents collapsed bins filled with corn. What went through your head when you saw this picture? Uh, I was lost going, oh my, this is what I don't need because this was my income yeah. for the season. That's, that's what I have to live on for the rest of the year. Here's what your corn is gonna look like. That is rotten corn. While forced from his home, David tells CBN News he remained hopeful. Returning to the farm each day, often by kayak, David cleaned up and prepared to plant corn and soybeans. We came in early, thought we were going to be able to maybe get a few acres in because waters were residing. Um, after March 24th, they were going down into April, they were going down. Then in May, the second flood came through sweeping away any chance of David farming this year. My faith is well founded and I just kind of give it all to God and just say, hey, show me your direction. And I truly believe I, I, I got those answers. And like he told me many years ago, everything's gonna be all right. David and his family needed that reassurance because the flooding has kept them out of their home a total of 130 days this year. I guess the biggest fear would be the financial aspect of it, but yet the farm will always be here. I may not be in business. That, that's to be determined. David says, ironically, one blessing is not having any expense in the ground. Still, times are tough. So we're living on a real tight budget right now. Thankfully, he's not alone. The best help has are church groups coming into the area. Bringing physical labor, food, and emotional support. And these were all at the emergency management uh, center for everybody affected by the flood. Um, just some good, uh, this had a few more snacks in it, more personal hygiene items. Um, just some things to, um, to help us out on some cleanup. Another concern for David, the ongoing trade war with China. What hurts me as a farmer is when our president says China doesn't matter. Well, on this farm, China does matter because they, my product, I never had, any, I, I didn't have any product left on the farm at the end of the year. You know, it was all sold and used, and that's a good feeling. And while he says we may win, he's worried how long it will take farmers to win back China's market. It's disappointing to me right now. I heard that Brazil has, uh, has over more than 75% of the China market to where that was part of our markets. Now, are we gonna get those markets back? I'm not too sure. Despite the challenges, David remains optimistic. Floods, famine, we're all gonna have them in our lives, but guess what, you believe in God and you can handle these things a lot, lot better. While there's still a lot of work to be done, David is hopeful that by Christmas, they'll have the farm back in operation in time for the 2020 season. Reporting from Percival, Iowa, Abigail Robertson, CBN News.
indomitable will, that's why we're going to win. We win because we've got people like David who will not bow down. Bomb cyclone or not bomb cyclone, he's going to make it. Yeah. And he said, the farm, the farm will still be there. I may not be there, but the farm will be there. Mm -hmm. God bless him. What a wonderful man. Terry. Yeah, well, they've got family history there, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, still to come, alone in the open ocean and gasping for air, two teenagers drowning in rough seas, and you'll never believe the name of the ship that saves them. And then the former Muslim who's now leading one of the largest churches in our nation. Why did he convert? That's later on today's 700 Club. Thousands of you have sent us your prayer requests, and our staff has been praying for your needs over the last few days. It's all part of our annual Seven Days Ablaze celebration. Well, yesterday, our featured speaker was Regents Director of Campus Ministries, Mark Lawrence. And here are some of the highlights from his dynamic message. It's so easy for us in our culture today to be self-absorbed. And if we're not careful, that mentality will creep into the church into the kingdom of God where I'm gonna to go to church today and park in my space, sit in my favorite seat, and hope that the worship team sings my favorite songs. Why? Because it's, it's all about me. And what we've even reduced God to is, my God has come to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, and we've so far taken it out of context because we believe God is here to make us happy. We think God, his sole desire and his sole intent is to make our life wonderful and grand. It's not about us, but it's really about God and his kingdom. Your life should be a living epistle. When they see you, they should see Jesus. When they hear you, they should hear Jesus. We've had some powerful messages this week. I hope you've been joining us online. If you'd like us to pray for you, there's still time. All you have to do is pick up your phone and call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Or you can log on to CBN.com. Pat? What a wonderful time. And we're going to be praying for you in just a few moments. But right now, exhausted arms, aching legs, Tyler and Heather, teenagers using every desperate ounce of strength to stay alive. The two friends had been swept out into the ocean with no rescue in sight. And time was running out. What spared them from a watery grave? It was a miracle. I would just saw like, it's not that far. Let's just go swim over there. It was a perfect beach day on Florida's East Coast. Tyler Smith and Heather Brown were enjoying senior skip day with their classmates from Christ Church Academy. Before long, they decided to swim across the St. Augustine Inlet from Volana Point to Anastasia Island, 500 yards away. We just kind of keep going like past the sandbar, just kind of keep getting deeper. As athletes, the two 17-year-olds were fairly good swimmers, but barely halfway across, they started getting tired. It was a lot further than we thought, but we saw a red buoy and we're like, let's swim to that, we'll grab onto it, we'll rest for a minute and then we'll just keep going. Despite their efforts, they weren't getting any closer to the buoy. It just kept getting further and further to the right but then it's like, you realize, no, you're moving further and further to the left. They had gotten caught in the outgoing tide. My heart was beating faster after I stopped seeing the red buoy. There's nothing left, all we see is ocean. Tyler and Heather stopped swimming and started treading water, doing their best to stay afloat as the current continued to carry them out to sea. That's when I was pretty actually like scared. And he was just like, Heather, I don't know what to do. I was like, Tyler, what's the plan? We were like, just keep swimming. Like, if, as long as you just keep yourself afloat, we can hold out till rescue. Back on the beach, their friends finally noticed the two were missing, unaware of their attempt to swim across the inlet. Someone called 911 and alerted their parents. Heather's mother, BJ, was helping at her church when she got the call. It's your worst nightmare of a phone call that you would ever want to have. 
He said, BJ, um, Heather and Tyler are missing. You know, nobody knew. And so I just, the tears start forming. They, I just start bawling. It was a deep panic that my child has drowned. BJ and others at the church started to pray for the missing teenagers. I want her alive, Lord. Please don't take her from me. You know, keep her floating. Give them both the strength. When there's nothing you can't do, you have to pray. By now, Heather and Tyler had been fighting the rough seas an hour and a half and praying desperately for a miracle. I was like screaming like, God, like, please help. Like, I was saying please over and over again. God, please just save us. Like, can you please just send something for us? I, I really thought that was gonna be the last day of my life. Then exhausted and losing hope, they heard a boat engine over the waves. All I see is this like big yacht just coming down along the island where all the other boats are going. And I was like, there's no way it's coming towards us, but it made even like a sharper turn towards us. The boat, however, wasn't coming for them. The owner, Eric Wagner, and his three-man crew were headed up the coast when they made a last-minute decision to take the 53-foot yacht for a run in the open ocean. The wind was strong. A lot of waves, the engines are loud. We have to talk loudly to hear each other on the boat, let alone somebody that's off the boat. As the boat passed by about 200 yards away, the teens realized no one had seen them. So I was just like waving it, screaming. This, to me, was our last chance. If we don't get on this boat, we're not getting out of here alive. We thought we heard a scream. We thought we heard something. And we all stopped talking and looked around. Troy was behind the wheel at the time. So he starts cranking the wheel over and he says, there's people back there. Heather and Tyler watched as the boat came around. And then all of a sudden, I see someone wave. And I was like, yes, yes. All we do is like hold up, like hug each other. We're like, we're getting out of this. Looking back at it, like God saved us from this. By the time they pulled the exhausted teenagers aboard, they had drifted two miles off the coast. Heather came on first. The very first thing she said to me, she looked me in the eye and she said, God is real. Mr. Eric heard me and he was like, it's crazy how you say that because you want to know the name of our boat? He's like, it's called the Amen. We just broke down crying. We were like, no way, like this is straight out of a movie. Like there's no way he did this. Then Heather's mom got another call. This time it was her daughter. I'm so glad to hear your voice. I'm so grateful. Like, oh my God, thank you, God. And it was just such a, like a celebration right there. Tyler and Heather went on to graduate and look forward to moving on to college and their future goals. But no matter where they go, they know they serve a God who loves them and answers their prayers. It really has brought me closer to talking to him like a friend. And it's just, it's miraculous. <laughs> It grows your relationship with God and relieves you of like doubt and it builds a bond when you are truly ready to come to him hopeless, like he's gonna rescue you. He's hopeless, he'll rescue you. What a wonderful testimony. It is an amazing story, oh, the amen. Amen. <laughs> well, just a little little run over to a little island and through a, a easy little passage and Suddenly, uh, they're going to die. Well, also, you've been on boats, as have I. To hear a, a, yes. a scream of any kind from a tired swimmer out yeah. there is, that, that's God. That, that's a miracle. <laughs> well, folks, uh, we've got thousands of prayer requests, and here are a few of them. Somebody said, I've got a blood clot in the brain and need prayer. Somebody says, I need to be healed of macular degeneration and cataracts. Somebody else has said, let's see, to be delivered from addiction to pornography and mm. marijuana. Wow. Cannabis. This is a person saying, I need my hearing in both ears restored. Someone else asking to be healed of a rare neurological disorder causing uncontrollable facial movements. And then healing for my badly fractured family after sexual abuse is revealed. Oh, dear. Serious, serious request. Oh. God Almighty is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. There's nothing impossible with the Lord. I mean, nothing is impossible with the God we serve. 
Now, Terry and I are going to join together, and we want to pray for you. And before us now, if you just see that we've got all these thousands of requests that have been coming in, <clears throat> people are crying out to God. A family is broken because of sexual abuse. Somebody's got macular degeneration. Somebody has a brain tumor. Serious things. But God Almighty is able. And we're going to join hands. Please pray with us. Nothing's impossible. Receive an answer. Father, nothing is impossible with you. With God, all things are possible. And we hold before you the cry of your people. Lord, they're crying out to you for answers. And we now are the messenger of those requests to you. And so we hold them before you. And we say, hear the cry of your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Terry, what do you have? Um, I'm sure this is more than one person, but you are frantic over your situation. You relate to the mom who got the phone call in that last story. And God is just saying to you, peace be still. I am here. I see you. I know I'm already at work. Rest in the Lord. Get into his word and touch his promises with your own heart and mind. Right now, God is healing people of addiction. They're, so we talk about oxycontin and codone. You're being healed of that. Some of you, cocaine. Some of you, heroin. Some of you, marijuana, whatever. But right now, God is reaching out and He's setting you free at this moment. Touch. Mm -hmm. Terry. Uh, there's someone else. You have a problem with the roof of your mouth. Um, it just in. It inhibits your eating correctly. It inhibits your speech pattern. God's healing that for you right now, and everything's going to be set back in order, and the, the firmness that you've lost that you need is going to be returned to the palate of your mouth in Jesus' name. Somebody right now, you just feel overwhelming joy. You want to laugh, and you want to laugh. And from deep down in your inside, you're laughing because the Lord is bringing you joy. He has made us glad, mm -hmm. and we will rejoice, for He has made us glad. Thank you, Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, just let that prayer and praise come forth. Something deep inside you feel it. Let it come out of your mouth. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Touch these lives who have requested prayer. Yes. Hear the cry of your people, and we rejoice in you. In the day when the sons of God shouted for joy and the song sang to the glory of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Lord. Amen. Give us a call as the Lord has touched you. Uh, we still, of course, receive requests, whatever they are, 1-800-700-7000. Okay. Well, still ahead, a follower of Louis Farrakhan who read the Quran from cover to cover what he saw in his dorm room, and how it changed his life. And then later, Pat weighs in on the issues that matter to you. Taylor says, I was baptized as a baby. Can I get baptized again? Stay tuned for another round of your questions and some honest answers. That's coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Most Americans trust the government to use facial recognition and biometric scanning responsibly. That's the finding from a poll by the Pew Research Center. It says people trust the government to use the technology for things like security threats. But NextGov.com also reports the public has much less trust tech companies or advertisers will use such technology responsibly. Austin, Texas is making it easier for women to get abortions. It is the first U.S. city to fund abortion support services. Now, this includes things like travel, lodging, and child care. Members of the Austin City Council voted to give $150,000 to the cause. They say its purpose is to remove barriers that might keep low-income women from getting abortions. This news out of Austin comes as states across the country pass legislations to restrict abortion. In Texas, abortion is now legal up until 20 weeks of pregnancy. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more Today 700 Club right after this.
Christianity was the white man's religion and Islam was for people of color. Well, that's what Derek Greer believed as a college student. Now, 30 years later, he's leading one of the fastest growing churches in the nation. So what changed? You're about to find out. Derek Greer, founding pastor of Grace Church, one of the fastest growing ministries in the nation, wanted to know why God seemed to stop and pay attention to some while bypassing others. You know, I have two boys. And, uh, you know, sometimes we put them in the crib when they were little and they cry. We ignore them <laughs> and they'll stop crying. But then you hear that cry <laughs> that you'll go through a wall to get to your child. And what I'm talking about in this book is that cry that causes God to stop everything he's doing, if you will, to make sure he tends to his child. In his book, When God Stops, Pastor Greer shares personal details from his journey of faith from Islam to Christianity. He also examines eight people in the Bible that got the Lord's undivided attention and how God also wants to stop for you. Well, Derek Greer is with us now and we welcome you to the 700 Club. It's great to have great you Great to be here. with you, Terry. When you were a teen, you were begging God to reveal himself. Yeah. Some of it was just looking around like we all do sure. at the injustice in the world sure. and some of the stuff you just can't explain. Sure. What was it that was going on in your heart and in your life then? Great question. In the 70s, you know, integration was new. Yeah. And uh, I was part of that generation that was integrating. And uh, in the, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and New York. And um, there was tensions yeah. and uh, it was us versus them. And uh, there was often fist fights and uh, all, all the rest. So I, I grew up with a dynamic, you know, that uh, they are they, we are us. And um, by the time I went to uh, college, I went to Howard University in Washington, DC. I, I you know, th those ideas had kind of been cemented. And um, by the way, I wasn't, I did not become a Muslim. Um, I was leaning toward Islam. Um, so what yeah. was it that attracted you yes. to Islam? I'm curious. Well, um, I, I re the, the autobiography of Malcolm X really impacted me. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I, I, I like the message of self-determination, self-help. Um, you know, hey, folks, we, we need to not wait for the government to fix this. We need Master to fix our own ownership. issues. Yes, yeah, yes. Exactly. So that was extremely attractive yeah. to me. So when I went to college, um, often in front of the student uh, center, you'd have uh, members of the Nation of Islam preaching, and they would call Christians handkerchief heads and uh, uh, Uncle Toms, and they would say that Christianity was a white man's religion. And uh, on some level, you know, I, 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 I thought, you know what, there's probably a lot of truth to that, because if we weren't Christians, perhaps we would have rose up in slavery and, and threw off the shackles. Uh, so I, I read the Quran, and actually, Louis Farrakhan at that time was a frequent um, uh, lecturer at the school. Yeah, so uh, he was there at least every year. And uh, I, I read the Quran for myself, and I was planning to actually uh, go to a mosque for the first time. I'm not from a Christian family, a Christian home. Uh, so you were wide open wide to whatever open. was coming your yeah, way. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so uh, after reading the Quran, I said, well, okay, uh, maybe there's some truth here. Um, but before I went to the mosque, I was in a class in Douglas Hall at Howard University, and uh, I was sitting in class, and I started to feel something I couldn't quite explain. Um, I felt disconnected. I, I felt I sin. settled, really. Too. Yeah. yeah. I, I had no categories in my mind for conviction, but I just knew that something's not right with me, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the wrong path. So I, I left class. Somehow I got through the class. I said, let, let me do this. Uh, if I'm having a mental breakdown, again, there's no categories for conviction in my mind. I'm going to go do this in private. So I went back to my dorm downtown and I laid in the bed, you know, just like a Friday night. Say, I'll sleep this off and I'll wake up. I'll be better. Tomorrow I'll be normal. Right. So uh, it just intensified. And before long, I moved from the bed to the floor. And while I was sitting there on the floor, just feeling this, this disconnected with a sense of lostness. I think mm -hmm. that would, I, I felt lost. And again, I, I had uh, uh, friends, girlfriends, money in my pocket. Life was good. What's wrong with me? What, what's my problem? So uh, while I'm sitting there, I see this man in a gown, and all he says is, this is it. And I felt what the presence of God. Well, I was amazed at the whole experience up to this point. Um, but I felt a presence 
that I felt once as a child. I talk about that in the book mm -hmm. uh, at summer camp. This is why it's important to get the gospel into kids because even if they don't respond at that moment, there is a future so point, yeah. yeah, that they could respond to. So for about a year, I studied the gospels and uh, Jesus just came alive from those pages. It wasn't his miracles. Um, what I think captured me about the Christ was his character. Yeah. This guy spoke to storms and the storm stopped. He, yes. But you say in the book, and I, I understand this, yes. that you, you know, who cannot be impressed with the power of the miracles and the message and the love and all yes. of that, but you couldn't deal with the cross. No. Because that was weakness yes. to you. Yes. How did God grab your heart and say that was for you? Absolutely. <laughs> It finally dawned on me. It, it took a while, but as I watched this Jesus um, handle life situations, opposition, he became a secret hero. And I, I didn't believe he was more than a man, but eventually that very cross, because how could a strong, powerful God die on the cross? It made no sense to me. But then I finally realized the only reason such a strong person could die is because he was not one of us. Yeah. Because he was more than just a man. Because a normal man would not have forgiven him from the cross. He would have said a whole lot of other things from the yeah. cross. But uh, I, I, it dawned on me, Jesus is the Christ. And then I walked down the uh, chapel aisles at Howard University and gave my life to Jesus. And the book you've written, When God Stops, yes. Faith That Gets God's Attention, is such an important message for all of yes. us. I mean, God stopped you in that dorm room, sure but it was a process after Absolutely. that of evolving into relationship with Him. Absolutely. In here, you, you look at eight biblical characters mm -hmm. who got Jesus to stop Absolutely. in the midst of things and see them. And He is Jehovah Rohi. So what... What do we all need to glean from this? First, we have to understand God's immutable, meaning he never changes. So what these characters did, if we do the same thing, we'll get the same results. This book is all about getting results. There were thousands and thousands of people that wanted Jesus' attention, but the Bible highlights folks that actually caused Jesus to stop. And in it, we have a blind Bartimaeus. Actually, Jesus was on the way to the cross. He stops on the way to the cross for Bartimaeus. Uh, the one with the issue of blood, he was on the way to Jairus' house, he stops. Uh, Zacchaeus, he stopped and stayed at Zacchaeus' house, on and on. These characters, the reason the, their narratives are recorded in the Bible is because Christ wants to stop for us. He wants to give us results. So the book is all about getting God results, becoming a God stopper, if you will, uh, in your life. It's, it's a wonderful book. I, I couldn't put it down. It was a great message. Really, all of us should read it to reinforce that He is the God who sees us, yes. and He calls us to action yes. in that role. So thank you so much for what you've written here. Uh, wonderful that your church is growing the way that it is. That's, I can understand why. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> for more with Derek Greer, get his book. It's called When God Stops, Faith That Gets God's Attention. And you can pick up a copy nationwide. He's also going to be the featured speaker in our chapel service want to remind you, you can stream that event by going to cbn.com at noon today. It'll be a treat for you. So join us. Thank you so much. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. Dave. Well, when we come back, time for some Q&A with Pat. Merritt says, I believe in Jesus, but I am a heavy beer drinker. Does this mean I'm not really a Christian? Pat's going to tackle that and more, so don't go away. Well, we have some time left to take the email questions that you all have submitted. And Pat, this first one comes from Merritt, who says, I'm saved. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for our sins, but I'm still a heavy beer drinker. Does that mean I'm not really saved? Well, I don't know what it is in your life. Uh, the Bible, it says, you know, uh, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. So uh, alcohol can can distort your reality, but you're a heavy beer drinker. I, I don't know what that means. It has really nothing to do with your salvation. It just has to do with whether or not you're living for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what I don't know is, you say, I believe in Jesus, but have you truly been born again? Has, you, has His Spirit come into your life? Have you been transformed? Are you, an, uh, you know, another person? Uh, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, you're a heavy beer drinker, so 
it seems like to me maybe you haven't gotten that far, but I, 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 I'm, only God can tell you if you're saved or not. I, I can't possibly tell you that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I were you, I'd do everything I can to make sure that you are living for the Lord. That's what's important. All right. Okay, this is Taylor who says, Hi, Pat. Is it possible to get baptized again, even though I was as an infant? <laughs> you know, uh, in the Middle Ages, there was a group called the Anabaptists that wanted to be baptized again. And, and some of the strong Calvinists took them out and said, you want to get baptized again? We're going to put you in the water and kill you. So there was some dunking. I mean, serious persecution serious. on the so-called Anabaptists. But, uh, you know, I, I, I came to the Lord in a Baptist church. I went forward and I was baptized. But I really didn't know Jesus. And later on, when I met Jesus as my Savior, was born again, I personally was baptized again as a believer because I really had been born again, but I wasn't born again before. So you ask me, how about you? I'll tell you what happened to me, all right? This is Carol who says, Pat, on your show, you said you don't believe that the earth is 6,000 years old, but really 66 million years old. I've heard an explanation that the dating methods are totally wrong, dating current items as millions of years old. What is it that convinces you that the dating process is correct? Well, uh, I know Hugh Ross, who's one of our guys. He's written some tremendous books. And uh, the, the thought is that there was a so-called Big Bang that started it all. It was about 14 billion years ago. And out of that came these gaseous modules. And from those modules, they, they, the, the planets formed. And it took a long time to get it done. Uh, Hugh Ross has written a book, you know, Our Amazing Planet, that shows how long it took to get all the processes in place uh, to bring about an Earth which was suitable for human beings. We've only lived on this planet a short period of time. Mankind, up to that time, it wasn't suitable. We had too many gases, too much um, the wrong kind of minerals. And out of that, God has put together a beautiful universe. But it didn't happen in 6,000 years. I'm sorry. That so-called creation science isn't scientific. It is wrong. And they've got geology to prove it. They've got cores in the ocean to prove it. They've got ice cores to prove it. You can go down the line of the geology. And there's no question that this Earth has been around here a long time. All right? Okay, this is Johnny who says, Dear Pat, I'm having a serious problem with my future wife. She has not been faithful. I overheard her talking to her friend about it. When I confronted her, all she said was that she couldn't talk right now. I feel like I have to record everything in my own house just to learn the truth. So that's what I've been doing. To make things even more stressful is the fact that she recently told a couple of people that I hit her, but it's not true. I'm not sure why she's been acting like this. She did just find out that her mother has breast cancer, and that might be playing a role in her behavior. What should I do? Johnny, there's a song. Yep. Yeah. I knew it was coming. <laughs> get out the back, Jack, leave yeah. off the key, Lee, and get yep. yourself free. That woman, you're not married to her. Get out now. I mean, if she's cheating on you when you were before you were married and you can't trust her, and now you want to spend your life together, you want to you have a legal obligation, get out of it. I mean, why do you ask me? I mean, common sense says this gal isn't for me. Mm -hmm. Run, Johnny. Okay, Johnny. Okay, <laughs> this is Michael who says, My mom and I have been struggling for nearly three months since she lost her job. She's still looking for a desk job position. Out of desperation, I made a deal with God by telling him if he gives my mom a desk job within two weeks or a month's time, then I'd be as patient as possible with anything that comes my way for a whole year. Is this deal I made with God a good or bad idea? I'm not the most patient man in the world. Well, you know, the problem with pledging things to the Lord is you're supposed to keep them. And uh, if you pledge to be patient for a year, will you be patient? And uh, What do you think about making deals like that? With well, God? I think people do that. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, the, they have a Nazarite vow. I, you know, you give me a baby and I'm going to, you know, l l look at the story of uh, Samuel and his mother. His uh, so I, I, I don't think that's necessarily bad. But remember, I mean, when you swear to God, you've done a major thing. So if your mother gets the job, 
you've got a year, you've got to behave yourself, and that's going to be hard. Okay. Well, today's power minute is from Psalm 34. I sought the Lord, and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Thanks so much for being with us. And I believe Gordon will be here in this chair tomorrow. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.